그럼 지금부터 오픈소스 소프트웨어 트랙을 시작하겠습니다. 바로 첫 번째 발표를 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 첫 번째는 파리대학교 로베르토 디 코스모 교수님께서 프랑스 및 유럽의 관점에서 본 오픈소스 소프트웨어 라이선스 관련 공공정책의 발전이라는 주제로 먼저 발표해 주시겠습니다. 여러분 로베르토 디 코스모 교수님을 큰 박수로 맞이해 볼까요? 프랑스 in various fields of computing from theoretical computer science to programming and software engineering. I spent over 20 years on open source software being an advocate and a developer and contributing to policy making. In the last 10 years, I dedicated my time to building and directing structures for the common good. In particular, I'm currently director of a Software Heritage, a universal archive of open source code that we will see later together. And I have been member for a few years of the National Committee of Open Science in France and recently appointed chair of the Task Force for Infrastructure of Quality Research Software of the European Open Science Cloud. If we look around us, we will see software all over the place. But software doesn't come out of the blue. It is written by humans using programming languages. In a word, this is a new form of knowledge. Software source code is a new form of knowledge that is at the same time human readable and machine executable. As was already remarked by Harold Abelson, a MIT computer science professor, in a beautiful book dating back of 1985 called Structure and Interpretation of Pro Computer Programs, where he says that uh, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Back in the 80s, there was just a little bit of source code, not enough for people to understand the deep meaning of the remarks of Professor Robinson. But today, thanks to over 30 years of open and free software development, we have access to an incredible amount of beautiful pieces of source code. Here is one that comes from the uh, control and command system of the Apollo 11 lunar landing module. So this piece of source code shows you on the left the mnemonic of the assembly code that will be translated into machine language, which is not very readable, you, you will agree. But the most important part for me today is to tell you about this part on the after the number sign on the right, because here you see text in English, which is actually a message sent from the developer to the other people that will need to read this source code later to understand what it does, and this other person may be the same developer in a few weeks or in a few years. More recently, we moved to two higher level programming languages, like the C programming language, which is used for this particular routine. But even if the programming language is more evoluted, we still need to choose a meaningful name for the variables, minimal names, meaningful names for the functions, and use comments, which will never go down to the machine, to tell us what is going on. And by the way, this is an excerpt of a Quake 3 Arena game, uh, and it is a beautiful routine that you can uh, find uh, on uh, described on uh, Wikipedia if you look for this special magic number here, 0x, 5f, 3759df. But anyway, I wanted to show you two simple examples to give you an idea of why source code is so important. 
And as Len Schustek, who was a former board director of the Computer History Museum, beautifully stated, software source codes provides us a view into the mind of the designer. As Yuval Noah Harari beautifully wrote in a recent article spawned by the COVID-19 crisis, we now know that the real antidote to epidemic or to any new unprecedented challenge to the whole of mankind is scientific knowledge and global cooperation. If we want to foster this global cooperation, it is important to remark that software is today a key pillar of modern scientific research. This has been already noted in Nature in an article dating back to October 2014, where they remarked that the, among the top 100 most influential papers of this very uh, uh, prestigious journal, the vast majority describe experimental methods of software in particular software, that have become essential in their fields. For this reason, access to the software is fundamental to advanced research, and access to the source code of this software is essential to understand what is going on. Even broad, more broadly than just uh, science and research, open source actually today powers most of our software infrastructure that run uh, the key infrastructure for our society. For all these reasons, since software source code is a precious technical and scientific knowledge, we actually need an infrastructure that preserves it and makes it easily accessible for everybody in the long term. But there is not only this reason to be interested in actually archiving and tracking and studying open source software. As you uh, have seen uh, today, most modern software is based on open source component. And if you use open source component to build our system, it is important to know where these open source components come from. And there is a broad, vast jungle of different infrastructure that are used for developing and distributing this source code. Yeah. Why is it important? This because it is important to know uh, where the software that we use, that you acquire, that we ship comes from, because it is also important to know where it has that or bug or that vulnerability and we need to trace it back to see what is going on. This is an important remark that has been made recently by an executive order by an American president in May 2021 dedicated to cybersecurity. In section four of this uh, executive order, you have the headline is enhancing the software supply chain security. And to this end, one important ingredient is to ensure and attest as much as is possible to the integrity and the provenance of open source software. In my own word, I would like to call this principle the Know Your Software Principle, K-Y-S-W, by hinting at the KWC, Know Your Customer Principle, which is so popular in banking. If we want to address this properly, we need a trusted knowledge base for software provenance that allows us to know and understand where all this software comes from. But let's take a step back and see where we are, because actually today we are really at a turning point. If we look back at the past, we see that there are numerous landmark software projects that have been developed but misplaced or lost while the creators are still alive. And so it is urgent to go out and collect their knowledge and make available their source code because it constitutes precious prior art. But also, we have seen recently, in the last few years, that business decisions taken by popular code hosting platforms like Google Code or Gitorios in 2015 can endanger millions of open source projects. Uh, in the shutdown in 2015, almost one million projects were uh, put at risk 
And even recent, more recently, Bitbucket, another popular platform, decided to phase out support of Mercurial as a version control system. And this endangered a quarter of a million of repositories. It is urgent to rescue and archive all of them. But, but rest assured, for these three, we already did our job and all of their contents is already safely stored in software. But the question is what we do for the many others that are out there. So it is urgent to take action because we only have a few years left before all this knowledge disappears. If we look at the future, what we see is that software development is skyrocketing. There are more programmers than ever and more code than ever is produced today. So if we want to make it easier to collaborate and to share research to results, we need to take action now. If we want to track open source code provenance, we need to act before it is too late. And to get to this, we need to build a universal platform to collect and share all the software source code worldwide. A universal platform because no country alone can develop such an infrastructure. The good news is that change is coming. From the policy level, there is a raising awareness of the importance of open source software, in particular for open science and for governance. And in, at the infrastructure level, the other good news is that the universal open shared source code archive is actually being built today by Software Heritage. In the rest of this presentation, I will cover these two sections, two different items separately. Let's start at the policy level. Policy has been evolving a lot. Uh, in what I'm presenting you here is a selection of uh, the many uh, elements which are relevant. Let me start with this call uh, uh, put forward by an expert group that met at UNESCO in November 2018. Uh, they worked together for a long time to study the relevance of source code for our society in the long term and they put out a call, written the Paris Call on Software Source Code, published in February 2018, which is available online. By the way, all the blue links, that you, all the blue text that you see in the slides here are actually clickable links that you can uh, follow to get to the relevant uh, documents which are supporting my presentation today. Among the many remarks made in this uh, key document, uh, one which is interesting for us today is the call to promote software development for open science, for open research. And this was written before the COVID crisis. And you know how important it has been to share the data and the software uh, in a, to, to build a valuable and quick response to this gigantic challenge. If we want to keep going in that direction, it is important to recognize in the career of academics the quality contribution to software developments and to share the good practices. You can sign this declaration if you want and look at it by clicking on this link. This is a high level at UNESCO 2018, an expert group. Uh, at, uh, at a policy level, we have in 2018 also the start of the work by UNESCO on recommendation for open science under the mandate of the member state that took three years and right today, 2021, in November, the um, uh, general conference of UNESCO is uh, examining this recommendation to vote on them in this very moment. Among the many uh, items uh, that are present in this recommendation for open science, I think two are particularly relevant for us today. One is a remark of the importance of open source for open science because it allows to uh, study, modify, adapt and adopt uh, works uh, produced by fellow scientists 
And the other is a remark that infrastructure that support open science should be organized and financed as non-profit and long-term, because this is what is needed for our, our open science. Moving now to Europe, there is a document produced by the European Open Science Cloud, which is an initiative by European Commission to build in a network of infrastructure for open science in Europe. This report is called the Scholarly Infrastructure for Research Software Report. It was published in December 2020. It, uh, I had the pleasure to chair the, this committee and bringing together nine infrastructure, archives, open access publishers, aggregators, uh, to study the status of infrastructure for uh, supporting research software in open science. And in this document, you will find a wealth of information and in particular recommendation that include the archival of all research software and software heritage using the software heritage identifier that we will see in a few minutes. Uh, the recommendation to use open and non-profit infrastructure, you see this is very similar to what UNESCO recommendation actually contain already. And the recommendation to make all research software open source by default. That is to say, to, unless there are serious reasons not to make it open source and they must be justified, research software should be open source by default to allow reuse uh, by other uh, researchers. Again, here, if you click on this link, you will find the original document that you can study in detail. Now moving to France, uh, very recently in April 2021, the French Prime Minister distributed, disseminated a directive on data and code. Uh, that contains significant uh, uh, decision to push forward uh, an open policy on data, algorithm, and code. In particular, there is a recommendation to step up, step up efforts by all the ministry to open up data from the public administration, which is available today on data.gov.fr to open by default the source code or software which is produced by the administration and received by administration, and to foster this progress, it announced the creation of an open source software mission that has been established just a few weeks ago, and uh, a network of officers whose role is to handle data, algorithm, and code policies. An early outcome of this kind of uh, vision in France on open source is the fact that the source code of software coming from the public sector is now being actively archived in the Software Heritage Universal Archive. Finally, last but not least, in July, on July 6th, the Ministry of Research in France unveiled the second national plan for open science for the period 2021 to 2024. This plan contains a full section dedicated to software, research software in particular, and with the uh, goal to promote the opening up and the development of research software, and making it available as open source. Among the remarkable actions, I do encourage you to have a look at the uh, full document available here. There is a the work to create a charter for a policy on research software to recognize software development, in particular through a uh, national prize on open science, which is undergoing right now. Uh, there are provisions to create a communication, um, a community of uh, practice and build a connected ecosystem research outputs. And among the recommendations, there are precise directives to archive in software heritage all the research software produced in France, to standardize the software heritage identifier and to promote their usage, to build a national catalog of research software and to leverage the network of the officer mentioned in the uh, directive of the Prime Minister we just saw 
In France, these people are called the ADAC for Administrateur des Données des Algorithmes du Code, I mean Officer for Data Algorithm and Code. Here too you can see the official announcement. So this provides you a view of how fast and how far progress is being made here in Europe and in France into uh, raising awareness, promoting the use of open source software at all levels in open science and in government. Now, the second part of my talk is about the evolution of infrastructures. We have seen we need dedicated infrastructures for software source code, able to collect software for, from everywhere to preserve it and to make it available over time. But the good news is that one such infrastructure is here today. It is called Software Heritage. It has been uh, launched five years ago. We are celebrating five years this year and there will be a special meeting at UNESCO for this next week. The mission of Software Heritage is actually to collect, preserve and share the source code of all software publicly available. On one side, this is to preserve our heritage, because as we have seen, source code is part of our cultural heritage. But on the other side, the goal is to actually enable better software development and better science for the benefit of society as a whole. In a nutshell, Software Heritage provides a reference catalog to find and reference all software source code, no matter where it is, among the tons of different software development and distribution platforms that exist and are in use. The second is to build an archive. All the software which is stored in Software Heritage is bound to be there, will be available, can be indexed by and identified by this software edge identifier. Last but not least, this is also a first building block for a global research infrastructure enabling us to study the evolution of software source code. Software Heritage today contains over 160 million projects and the source code files from all these projects are actually deduplicated. I mean, we keep just one copy if we can see many copies of the same object. And this is this amounts to over 11 billion uh, unique software source files. They come from different uh, code development and distribution platform. The most relevant are shown here. And today, this amounts to over 700 terabytes of uncompressed data. And uh, uh, as a graph globally, because we keep track not only of the source code, but also of all the versions, which are called commit in technical patterns, and all the history of development of the software. And this created a gigantic graph with over 20 billion nodes and 200 billion edges. Each of the software artifacts which are stored in the archive is associated to a unique identifier, which is basically a hash computed from the software component itself. These identifier have a simple structure in four parts, a prefix SWH that tells us it is a software ident heritage identifier, a number, which gives us a schema version, because the schema can evolve over time. A tag that tells us what is the object that is identified. And you may have many kinds of objects. A file content, a directory, a revision, a release, a snapshot. And finally, the hash itself, which is computed from a file in a natural way, or if it is a director revision, release or snapshot by applying a technique which is known as a Merkel tree construction today. Uh, these identifiers can also be equipped with qualifiers that are very helpful to annotate an, an artifact to know where it was found, uh, what lines of code, if it is a file content, are relevant, what is the file name or the path, relative to a particular revision, and even what is the state of the repository when it has been archived. 
This is an emerging standard. It is now mentioned in the Linux Foundation's Software Package Data Exchange version 2.2. The prefix is registered with IANA and there is a Wikidata property that corresponds to it. I do encourage you to actually click on these blue links on the slides that will be made available after the presentation so that you can actually see how these identifiers together with software editors allows you to get to a, a, a beautiful view and access to software source code, including the excerpt of source code. And this will bring you to exactly the same source code you have seen in the first slide of my presentation. Software Edge is a revolutionary infrastructure for software source code for many reasons, but here are two of them. First of all, we really keep all the graph of software development all software development in the world in a single graph that allows you to trace the origin and the evolution of every single piece of source code out there. This is very important because it provides us an archive that preserves all open source software, ensure that you will have access to the exact version of the source code, which is relevant for you when you need it. But also because this is not any graph, but it is a Merkle graph that uses cryptographic identifier, we also have a sort of blockchain, not a full, but a sort of blockchain of software development. These cryptographic identifiers, the software heritage identifiers, are essential complements to the software bill of materials because they provide you with a traceability which is trusted. And there are over 20 billion artifacts already which are identified this way in the software heritage archive. Well, this was a, 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 a very short, very dense overview of what software heritage actually is and tries to do, mostly on the technical side. Let me provide you now an overview of our vision at the policy and organizational level. Software heritage is not a company, it's not a startup, it's not here to sell a product to anybody. It is actually an infrastructure, an open, non-profit, international initiative to build a long-term infrastructure at the service of all of mankind. In doing this, we are sharing our vision and have set up a partnership with UNESCO five years ago. It will be renewed in a meeting next week. And we have the support of many organizations. But besides that, we also count on donors, members, and sponsors to support the day-to-day -day cost and the growth of this incredible universal archive that is an infrastructure that service to everybody. First of all, INRIA is the National Research Center dedicated to computer science and applied mathematics in France started to support this initiative over five years ago and slowly over time we, a, a, many other partners have decided to come on board. Uh, as you see in this short uh, overview, you have private companies, you have government entities, you have academia, you have any kind of organization. And it is very important to have more coming on board to share the cost of building this infrastructure and share the privilege of uh, steering it towards its long-term mission. If you want to join, it is very easy. You can find all the details of the sponsorship and membership program in this link here. And feel free to contact me if you want to know more. Well, to conclude, let me say that the road ahead is, is still long, but we are really set in the right direction. From the policy side, we see a clear evolution that puts open source squarely at the center of attention for open science and open government. We also see open source and in particular tools and infrastructure to track open source at the center uh, of our focus when we are talking about cybersecurity today. And I will not be, I would not be surprised to see in a uh, uh, not very distant future uh, regulations on directive that uh, requires open source software to be actually properly archived and referenced in bill of materials to 
ensure that we have a better quality of the software system we re all rely upon today. From the infrastructure point of view, we also see a, a real groundbreaking change with the arrival of Software Heritage, which is building this global open shared platform to archive all software source code. And here it is important to have more and more organization, industry, people joining us and make this work. When this is, was a, a basically the kind of information message I wanted to share with you today, I think we stop here and we'll be more than happy to take any question you may have. Thank you for your attention. Professor Cosmo, can you hear me? Hey, yes, uh, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? <laughs> 네, 네, 감사합니다. 네, 정말 잘 들립니다. 네, 그럼 제가 여러분들의 질문 중에 몇 가지를 발췌해서 드려보도록 하겠습니다. 로베르토 디 코스모 교수님께 드리는 첫 번째 질문입니다. 르노나, 폭스바겐, 아우디 등 유럽 회사 대부분이 해킹 문제로 GPL V3를 티어 1에 사용하는 것을 금하고 있습니다. 그러나 리눅스에서 배시 프로그램 버전 4는 GPL V3입니다. 따라서 티어 1은 배시 프로그램을 V3로 다운그레이드 해야 합니다. 버전 4에는 쉘 쇼크와 같은 취약점이 있기 때문이죠. 어, 이렇듯 오픈 소스 라이선스의 보안 문제가 존재하는데 이 해결을 위해 무엇을 해야 하는지 의견을 듣고 싶습니다라는 질문이네요. 네. 아, uh, so here's the first question. Most Europe OEM as Luno, Volkswagen and Audi has not allowed to use GPL V3 and LGPL V3 to international tier 1. That is because they are not confirmed for system hacking issues. But in the Linux environment, for example, Bash program as version 4 is GPL v3. So tier 1 should be downgraded from 4 to 3. Uh, Bash version 4 has the critical software weakness points as a shell shock. So open source software license and uh, software security is opposite each other. We want to know your opinion about how to reduce any gap between prohibited open source software license by OEM and software security. Well, okay, thank you for this. It is a very interesting question. It goes back to the old um, issue of uh, basically what I would call security by obscurity if I understand well the question. Um, if you want to keep a system secure, there are basically two approaches. One is to hide completely the source code. Do not allow anybody to access it or to modify it. Only authorized people can do it. This way, you may hope to uh, hide any bugs to hide the vulnerabilities because nobody can look at the source code. In practice, it doesn't work very well. Vulnerabilities and bugs can be found even directly on the binaries, even without the source code. And there are tons of vulnerabilities and bugs uh, around for proprietary software in general. The other approach is go the open source way. And this means making the source, the source code available to everybody to contribute and to inspect. This means that it will be easier to find vulnerabilities. So yes, we are making the attacker's life easier, but it will also be possible to rely on a larger community uh, to identify the same bugs and fix them. 
better than what a single company could do. So this second approach may work very well for security if you have a large active community that is competent and can actually fix the mistakes quickly. And the experience we have over the past decades is that this open source approach can work well, but only if you have a broad community around it, which is competent and reactive. So this is not a matter of license. It is a matter of process. And again, we, we know this very well. Security is a process issue. Okay? because a, a system is as weak as the weakest part of it. I wouldn't uh, support the idea that security is just a matter of lightness. It is really a matter of process. Uh, 네, 어, 먼저 이런 질문을 해주셔서 정말 감사드립니다. 말씀해주신 문제는 퀄리티 문제라고 생각됩니다. 어, 또 보안 문제에 대해서 얘기해 주셨는데 여기에 대한 접근법을 두, 개, 두 가지에 대해서 말씀드리려고 합니다. 첫 번째는 소스 코드에 대한 접근을 어, 좀더 쉽게 해야 한다는 것입니다. 어, 왜냐하면 이런 취약점은 언제든지 숨겨, 숨길 수가 있는데요. 그러나 이 소스 코드 없이는 이런 취약점을 찾기가 또 어렵습니다. 또 어, 그렇기 때문에, 아, 그렇기 때문에 이 소스 코드의 접근을 좀더 쉽게 만들어야 합니다. 두 번째 접근은 이, 소, 오프, 이 소스 코드를 모두가 이용 가능하게 해야 한다는 것입니다. 그래야 이러한 취약점들을 좀더 쉽게 찾을 수 있기 때문이죠. 또 물론 이를 대응하는 좀더 공동, 거, 커다란 공동체가 있다면 이와 같은 노력에 참여해 주시는 것이 또 좋습니다. 보안 문제에 있어서 이런 공동체들이 자신들의 경험과 이 접근 방법에 대해서 공유하게 된다면 어, 이러한 문제를 해결하는 것이 훨씬 더 원활해질 것입니다. 그리고 말씀드린 것은 어, 여쭤보신 문제는 어, 라이선스 문제라기보다는 이 안보에 대한 과정이라고 저는 보고 있습니다. 어, 이런 시스템의 취약점들을 파악해야 하는 그 과정이라고 저는 생각하기 때문에 이 보안 문제는 그 과정에 있어서 우리들이 좀더 초점을 맞추어야 한다고 생각합니다. 네, 답변이 되셨나요? 여러분들의 흥미로운 질문 그리고 교수님의 훌륭한 답변까지 잘 들어봤습니다. 감사합니다. Uh, so, Professor, this is thank you for your answer and thank you for having your time. Okay, thank you for having me here and had a good conference, all of you. Sorry for not being there in person. Thank you. 네, 여러분 모두 감사드립니다. 이번 컨퍼런스에 초대해 주셔서 정말 감사합니다. Okay, Professor, thank you. 네, 교수님께 박수 한 번만 보내주시죠. <웃음> 감사합니다. 시간 관계상 한 가지 질문만 발췌해서 저희가 들려드렸는데요. 이후 더 궁금한 점이 있으신 분들은 연사께서 발표 마무리쯤에 이메일 주소를 남겨주셨죠. 그곳으로 문의를 하시면 더욱더 상세한 답변 들으실 수 있으실 겁니다.